Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. So on the screen I have some code from the blog that you should have typed out with yourself into Remix and then reviewed. And the question that I posed was, what is wrong with this code from a business logic perspective as well as any kind of authentication authorization issues? So if you haven't read the blog yet, go back and do that and hop back in and let's get started. So the first thing I would do is check out what the public functionality is. What can I call as an attacker without any authentication, authorization, nothing else. So first we have public functions on all of these. So these are all publicly callable. And if we look at the definitions or we look at require statements, we don't have any require statements and we don't have any kind of modifiers up here. So presumably an attacker could call any of these functions as well as any user could call any of these functions, regardless of whether they're included on some kind of UI in an application. So first I would look at anything that seems off since they're all public. We have a kill function which stands out a bit and it's using self-destruct. Now self-destruct if you're not familiar with it is from the Solidity language and it will render a contract useless. It basically kills it off and you can no longer call any functionality. So the fact that this is public is pretty suspect and also very, very dangerous. So we'll take note of that and we'll come back to it. Going top to bottom, since everything else seems kind of standard, right? We have a deposit, we have a withdraw. These are pretty standard functionality. It's nothing really off with that. If we take a look at deposit, all it's really doing is taking in a value and it's applying that value to the sender's balance, right? The message dot sender is the person calling the contract and that's up here in this balances mapping, right? We're taking the address and we're applying the uint value to it. So there's not really anything particularly wrong with this other than there's no user registration. Anybody could sign up for this really by just sending in a value and mapping that value. So that may or may not be a problem depending what you're doing. So that's just something to think about. The next function is our withdraw function. Withdraw function on the surface looks okay, but there's a lot wrong with it. So we're sending in an amount. The amount is what we want to withdraw. And we're going to withdraw that via a transfer function to the person who called the contract. So that seems logically correct, but we're not actually checking that we A, have those funds, or B, are even a user of this contract, right? So presumably, we could call into this contract and withdraw any amount we wanted, regardless if this withdraw function was available to us, because we could just call it with a Web3 call, and we'll show how to do that probably in our next video. So that's something we're going to want to check when we actually run it. Could we just take out any amount that we want? And the answer is probably yes, because I don't see anything stopping that. Now, if you were talking to a developer, they would probably tell you, well, that's not really our problem. That should be implemented on the UI. We're just adding a functionality here. But the problem is this is a immutable contract, meaning you cannot change the code later. And it's a public function, meaning anybody can call it regardless of what's on that UI. It functions like an API in that way. That's why it's a problem. And then if we take another look at the kill function, you'll also notice that the self-destruct takes in a value of message.sender. Message.sender is whoever calls the contract, meaning you, me, the attacker. How is that used? Well, the message.sender is the address of where all of the funds in the contract are going to go when this contract is self-destructed. So think about that for a moment, the implications of that. Everybody could put all of the funds into this contract, an attacker could call this public function that was mistakenly put here as public and withdraw all of the funds from this account. It's not going to send it back to the users who actually put the funds in. It's all gonna to go to the attacker. So that's a big deal. So even though this is just 18 lines of code, there's a lot wrong here. As soon as you start looking at it, what looks like, oh, it's just a deposit and a withdraw function, it's a very simple contract, no big deal. There's so much wrong with it, it would be detrimental to anybody actually using it. In order to show that, let's compile it and put our assumptions to reality and see if what we actually think happens. So we'll hit compile and then we will deploy it. And then let's add some value into each of the accounts. So let's add value into the first three accounts. 
So let's put in 10 Ether and we'll deposit that in the first account. So now we're down to 89 and then we're gonna put 10 into the second account and we're gonna put 10 into a third account. The first issue we had was, well, anybody could sign up for that. So we just proved that we can just use it. We don't need any registration. So that may or may not be an issue. Depends on the use of your contract. And our second thing was with the withdraw function. Can we withdraw as much as we want? Well, we put 10 into each account. So what happens if we take this first account and try to take out 15? So let's try that, right? So we'll say 15 and then we need 18 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So that should be uh, 15 ether because it's to the power of 18. So when we hit withdraw, we should go up to roughly 104. And that's correct. So we put in 10 and that account that only had 10 in their balance actually was able to withdraw 15, which means that five ether is not going back to one of these two users. First problem, definitely a problem. The last thing to think about was this kill function. So we put 30 into this smart contract. We have 15 left. So we'll keep using our attacker account, which has 104 on there. And we have 15 left in this contract. If we hit kill, since it's public, we should be able to call it as an attacker and we should get all of the funds, meaning that we'll end up with like, I don't know, 119-ish. So let's give that a try. So if we hit kill, and we do indeed end up with 119. So with Remix, we're actually able to test all of these. We have these buttons down here. We're actually able to call in and then check all of the things that were wrong with our contract. But what do you do if you were reviewing the code in the blockchain? You notice some of these issues and the UI to say a mobile application that was using the blockchain, it didn't have a kill function, right? And your withdraw function in the server side code for the application somewhere was actually checking, oh, hey, does he have enough of balance? And then the deposit function, you had to have a registered user before you could even call it anyway, right? So all of this is covered in the UI and server. Is it okay? Well, no, not really. And in the next video, we're gonna use Web3 to directly make these calls. And we're gonna use an ABI file to map these out and actually do that. So stay tuned to the next video. Hopefully you learned something in this video and it was fun. If it was fun, please like the video, share it out to some people, and I will catch you in the next video where we actually make some more direct calls as if we were trying to attack this contract.